This video about Tiger Repair is sponsored by World of Tanks, yet more on this later. The Tiger is probably the most famous German tank of World War II, yet when it comes to repair, there are usually just a few lines mentioned that it was hard to maintain due to interleaving track wheels and that's it. Well, I think it's time to add a few more lines here. First off, we need to consider a few aspects. Tanks are not cars and World War II tanks were far cry in terms of reliability of most of our modern equipment we have now. After all, tanks ha have a weight 10, 20 or even more times than our modern cars. Additionally, they were designed, produced and maintained without any modern technology like computers, precision measuring and a lot of other fancy stuff I don't know about since I'm not a mechanical engineer. In other words, tanks were quite vulnerable as pointed out by Dixon in his article about Soviet tank repair. While it may not be obvious to the infantryman cowering in his foxhole as the tank approaches, tanks are vulnerable things, often operating at the limit of their engines and transmissions capabilities, and it doesn't take much to put them out of service. Of course, the situation got worse with heavier tanks. This is also reflected by the organizational setup when one compares the assignment of maintenance units to panzer units. A Panzerwerkstattzug workshop platoon was allocated to a Panzerabteilung, which is a battalion, while a Panzerwerkstatt company, essentially consisting of two workshop platoons combined together, was allocated to a Panzerregiment, an exception where the heavy Panzer battalion Stiger, which had a full Werkstatt company instead of just a single Werkstattzug. Of course, one could argue that the Tigers received preferential treatment due to their combat effectiveness and a rather high price compared to regular tanks. Additionally, it doesn't stop with the maintenance company, because if one takes a closer look at the 1944 organization of a Tiger battalion, one notices that there was a maintenance company and a supply company, yet the later also included a maintenance detachment. So what is the difference here? According to Schneider, the maintenance detachment only did routine maintenance together with the panzer crews and fixed minor damage, where severely damaged vehicles were handed over to the maintenance company. Similarly, the US report on German tank maintenance, which was mainly written by former general, German general notes, tank maintenance detachment personnel were responsible for effecting any repair that did not require more than half a day's work. Damages of greater magnitude could be repaired by detachment personnel on condition that they were staying in one location for an extended period. When necessary, a maintenance detachment could replace an engine by means of an improvised hoist, even though this work went beyond the scope of its normal duties. This was in contrast to the tank maintenance company. The principal task of the tank maintenance company Panzerwerkstattzug was to repair those tanks which could not be repaired by the maintenance detachment, or if necessary, to transfer them to the depot maintenance installation in the rear. In order to carry out this mission, the maintenance company had to have the proper tools and spare parts, as well as carefully selected personnel. Although be aware that there was no strict delineation between the functions of the detachment and those of the company, the decision of assigning repair jobs to specific units usually depended on the tactical situation and the capacity of the maintenance detachments. Since we have some basics outlined, let us look now at the specifics about repairing a Tiger. Various challenges arose with the heavy tanks and yes, this also means the Panther. These problems were clearly not limited to field workshops, by the way. In 1943, when the first disabled Panther and Tiger tanks began to arrive in Vienna, new facilities were needed because the hydraulic lifts were not strong enough to handle the heavier equipment. A nearby locomotive shed contained one 40-ton and two 16-ton cranes as well as suitable workshop areas for turret, weapon, engine and transmission repairs. The supervisors selected for the repair of the heavy tanks were particularly skilled mechanics who were in charge of military shop personnel. And let us start with the obvious here, the interleaf track wheels. Most of you might know that those caused a bit of a trouble, but I think you might still underestimate the actual troubles involved. The interleaf track wheels at first look like two layers, but it is actually four layers as you can see here. Additionally, two of those layers have double wheels as well. Although this is only valid for Tigers produced until February 1944, since then a new design was used that only had three layers and only the middle layer used double wheels. Generally, this new design had many benefits. The time-consuming removal and installation of track wheels 
when changing from transport tracks to combat tracks was no longer necessary. The changeover to rubber sprung steel track wheels was probably a considerable relief for the crews, especially as frequent replacements due to damaged tires and during loading was no longer necessary. Although there were also problems with the new setup as well, since there was less leeway. Generally, this setup, especially the early version, could mean that for replacing a single inner wheel that was damaged, for instance by a mine, could require the removal of 11 other wheels to get to the wheel itself, or even more wheels if the center and innermost wheels were to be replaced. Of course, some of you might wonder why use such a complicated design in the first place. Well, to quote from the British wartime report printed in David Flesser's book about the Tiger, the boggy wheels are arranged to overlap each other, thus increasing the number of spring units and resulting in a soft suspension. This arrangement is not altogether unexpected, since it was previously been encountered in German tracked vehicles, and its merits are obvious, particularly dealing with the suspension of an unusually heavy vehicle. The next elements were the tracks. Each track weighed more than 2 tons, or 2,900 kg to be exact. It was crucial the track had the right amount of tension, because too much or too little would damage the Tiger. Too little track tension increased the danger of the track slipping and throwing. A track that was too tight would overlap the track tensioner and the bearings in the final drive and the sprocket, which could result in increased wear and breakage. In certain cases, tracks could be under too much tension, which would mean that they could only be opened by using a welding torch. We also have some data for the 503rd Heavy Tank Battalion for the time frame 5th July 1943 to 21st of September 1943. During that time, the maintenance company repaired a total of 240 Tigers. Yet it is explicitly noted that this number does not include maintenance performed by the maintenance teams, the E-Gruppen or the Instandsetzungsgruppen, which usually repaired minor damage to the running gear. On average, in that time frame, 10 to 12 Tigers were operational. Furthermore, there is also some data on the recovery platoon. The towing half tracks for, the, for nine months on average towed a distance of 7,000 kilometers, so about 777 kilometers per month on average. So before we sum this up, let us talk shortly about some of the equipment used in the Panzerwerkstatt company. On my main channel, you can see a more detailed overview of the company and the whole battalion, by the way. Here we'll just touch a bit on the heavier equipment. In total, there were three trucks with a three ton crane equipped. These were used for lifting the smaller elements, for instance. The three ton crane was used to lift the engine compartment cover plates and the engine itself. Combined, these could also be used to lift the turret. It took two cranes and a skilled operator to lift the turret. Additionally, there were also a number of six ton cranes. These were mounted on the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 9-1 Farmo half-track. Without the crane, it is just the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 9, in case you wondered. Now, for the Panzer 3 and 4, the Sonderkraftfahrzeug 9 was the standard towing vehicle. As you can imagine, this didn't work out so well for the big cats like the Panther and the Tiger, where two or even three of these half-tracks were needed, depending on the quality of the ground. This is where the Berge Panther comes in. Although be aware, the Berge Panthers varied quite a bit. It was not before July 1943 when the first Panthers were for turrets and in August 1943 the first Berge Panthers with a winch were deployed. Each Panzerwerkstatt company was issued three Berge Panthers. The Berge Panther was not just a turretless Panther. It came with various additional features. Ideally, a Berge Panther was equipped with a 40 ton winch. Yet due to its limitations in production capacities, this was not always the case. After trials at the testing facility in Kummersdorf, it was noted that a crane for changing the engine would be a good addition. Werskraft, which was the testing agency for motorization in Kummersdorf, thereupon developed a two-ton makeshift crane which could be screwed onto all recovery and battle tanks. It was tested, but the general introduction and especially the retrofitting of all already used armored vehicles was no longer possible due to the events of the war. Note that the maintenance detachment within the supply company had additional vehicles authorized, namely one truck with a three-ton crane and one half-truck with a six-ton crane and two Berge Panther. Yet what is far more interesting is the gentle crane, which unless I missed something, does not show up in the table of equipment and organization. These cranes could pull, depending on their type, 15 to 16 tons, 
Usually around two of those were issued per Tiger Battalion. To summarize, repairing and maintaining the Tiger was in some cases quite different from the earlier Panzers, like the Panzer III and IV, not only due to its size and weight, but also due to interleaving track wheels. The size and weight were clearly an issue as well, as illustrated by the fact that even workshops in Germany had problems dealing with first tanks coming back from the front. It is without question that certain design decisions and the matter that the Tiger was a heavy tank made it high maintenance. But then again, so is Garfield, and we still like him. And speaking of big cats and tanks, this brings us to the sponsor of this episode, the free-to-play game World of Tanks, which made this video possible in the first place. Now if you want to get started with World of Tanks, they provide a special invite link for new players that is linked at the top of the description. This link gives you immediate access to a tier 5 premium Matilda Black Prince, 7 days of premium time, 1 garage slot and a 100% train crew. You might ask what about the Tiger? Well you also get 2 rental tanks for 10 battles each, namely the famous Tiger 131 of the tank museum at Bobbington, which once roamed the North African desert. And since you also might want to go Tiger hunting, the second rental tank is the British Sherman Firefly. So if you want to ambush one or more of the million players worldwide, head on in. Of course, you can also charge in and deal it out up close and personal, since World of Tanks allows for many different playstyles. Yet we are not done yet. This year there's a virtual tank fest, which means there's an online stream as well. It is also linked in the description. Big thank you here to World of Tanks for sponsoring this episode. Be sure to check out the link in the description. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.